Am I sharing it? Are you, are you sure you're recording? I am sure I'm recording. I hope I'm recording. It says it's recording. Number one. It's all good. I screw up on a daily basis. So we're waiting. How many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Two, three, and then it changes. Okay, oh, there it is. Oh, there's six. Yeah. Six. What up, Lake? <laughs> 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 I was like, I was like, All right. So we got Natalie here. And so everybody at seven minutes, I'm going to cut you guys off uh, at seven minutes hardcore just so we all stay on track, even we started a bit late here. And so without further ado, Natalie's going to tell us about uh, the Pinnacles. All right, hello, my name is Natalie, and my uncle story is about proposing Trona Pinnacles National Monument. All right, Trojan, Trona Pinnacles is currently managed under the Bureau of Land Management and is located within the California Desert National Conservation Area. The Pinnacles are located about 25 minutes east of the city of Ridgecrest and sit between um, Death Valley National Park and Mojave uh, National Preserve. Trona Pinnacles gets its name from the over 500 white tufa spires that it contains. These pinnacles were formed underwater between 10,000 and 100,000 years ago throughout three ice ages. Searless Lake, which is the dry lake basin that the pinnacles sit on, was a part of a series of interconnected lakes flowing from the Owen Valley to Death Valley. Being a part of this system of lakes helped shape how these pinnacles look today. The spires are composed of tufa, which is a type of limestone formed as a byproduct of carbonate minerals in the lake mixing with calcium-rich waters that likely flowed in from streams underneath the lake bottom. The lakes eventually dried out, leaving the pinnacles behind. Another cool fact about this area is that the Trona Pinnacles was about 640 feet underwater at one point during the Pleistocene era. The formations at Trona Pinnacles come in a variety of shapes and sizes with four general categories, those being towers, tombstones, ridges, and cones. Towers are thinner than they are tall and the formations can rise up to 30 to 40 feet. They have summits that are either flat pointed or rounded. Tombstones on the other hand rise up to 20 to 30 feet and are wider than they are tall. Ridges are immense sawtooth tufa runs. The location has three ridges. One of them is 800 feet long, 500 feet wide, and 140 feet tall. This, is, this ridge is the highest formation at Trimmer Pinnacles. Cones are the smallest formations, coming in about 10 feet tall. Cones are mounted structures and are found scattered throughout Trona Pinnacles. Due to Trona Pinnacles' um, unique and strange geologic formations, it has been a film site for a bunch of projects. Most of these are in the realm of science fiction, as the formations are outerworldly and alien-like. In fact, over 30 film productions a year are filmed here. Most of these are car commercials, some more familiar science fiction movies and TV series that have been filmed at this location is Battlestar Galactica, Star Trek V, which is at the top. Um, Disney's Dinosaur, The Gate to Trespassers, Lost in Space, and Planet of the Apes, which is at the bottom. Um, a few big movie star, uh, music stars sorry, have also filmed music videos at this location, Rihanna used this location as a for its intergalactic landscape and picturesque skies to film her music video for her song Sledgehammer by from the movie uh, Star Trek Beyond. Lady Gaga also used this location as a background for her 2020 single Stupid Love Me video. Recreation at Trona Pinnacles is free of charge. Visitors can camp on the land for up to 14 days, either through several or se several separate visits throughout or through 14 continuous days of overnight occupation during a 28 day period. Currently only one facility is available at the location, which is a single boat toilet. 
Visitors often partake in climbing up many of the formations there are because there are many hand and play holes, although I assume this is not great for the structures. Hiking is also popular. Um, I would say though that the most popular activity is photography. Not only are the formations a great focal point for, for photographers, but the night skies are as well. Many photographers will visit to capture the Milky Way, starting lights and constellations. Visitors will punch a turn of pinnacles to also just sight sightsee and look at the night sky as well. These unique Tufa pinnacles are not currently represented in the National Park System. They, the Pinnacles National Park obviously has pinnacles, but their structures are formed from volcanic activity rather than calcium carbonate. Turn of pinnacles would protect and add many features to the National Park System, making this a national monument would also help to preserve a place that could eventually become a place of history. Some of these movies and series that were filmed at this location, such as Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica, have had a lasting impact on American culture. Being able to conserve these areas for future generations would be valuable. Searless Lake, the basin um, which it lies on, contains chemicals such as borax, soda ash, salt cake, potash, and lithium deposits from runoff from a water, from water melting off of Ice Age glaciers. According to California Historical Landmarks, this lake is the world's richest chemical storehouse and contains half of the natural elements. Mining is still happening and being able to protect this, this a part of this lake basin will save hold these elements for future before it's mined out of existence. Um, the area I mapped out for the reclassified Trona Pinnacles National Monument came out to be 276 square miles and includes all 500 pinnacles, a portion of the mountain range to the right, and a part of Panamint Valley. I chose to include a portion of Panamint Valley into my site to, cut, to try to cut back on nearby grazing, mining, hunting and hunting allowances. Doing this will not only preserve the land that the pinnacles are on, but also further protect ecological beauty. Um, there are a number of vulnerable species that would benefit from this, uh, including the log and head shrike, um, the horn lark, the burrowing owl, the agos, agosis in desert. Agassiz. <laughs> yeah. The Mojave ground squirrel, Kit Fox and Desert Bighorn Sheep. Being a part of the California Desert Conservation Area, this means that the land directly around the 500 or so pinnacles is protected against grazing, hunting, logging, mining. On the other hand, Panamint Valley, which is above Trona, is uh, protected but still allows, is not protected and still allows for grazing, logging, hunting, and mining. While I researched, um, I ended up calling their information desk and she told me that they're having problems with uh, people using the site as a shooting range and also um, ATV use. Uh, regardless of this, um, I believe that the Bureau of Land Management is doing an excellent job of making sure the area is clear of trash and keeping up on facility maintenances. I believe that China Pinnacles would be a strong candidate for the National Monument for, a na for becoming a national monument within the National Park Service. I chose to classify China Pinnacles as a national monument since it sits on federal land and the Antiquities Act could be used to make this change. Making the China Pinnacles into a national monument would not only help further protect and bring awareness to China Pinnacles and the species um, and resources within it, since the staff of Bureau of Land Management is not struggling a great deal with managing the area. I would suggest that they continue to manage the area after it is converted to a national monument. The area would be considerably bigger than it was before. Because of this, I would suggest that the National Park Service provide either temporary or long-term staff trained by the existing staff to help manage. Um, I do suggest that the National Park Service provide additional help when it comes to enforcing recreational shooting and off highway vehicle regulations. 
This could come in the form of training courses or additional on-site staff that's specifically in charge of regulating those activities. I would also suggest that the addition of informational signage be used to discuss the vulnerable species around the monument and establishing walk zone, no walk zones that around vulnerable native native vegetation areas would be beneficial. Okay, um, got to wrap up. We're we're way over. So cool. All right, thank you, Derek. All right, Rocket is next. No, because we want to, we need time. To, we need no, we need time to upload it, so we don't want to waste time. So yeah, nope, Rocket, you're next. All right. So uh, so um, while while he's calling up his presentation, uh, just uh, I'll signal you guys when we're six minutes. I'll raise my hand at six. At seven, I'm just going to start cutting you off because we're going to not. We'll be here till midnight if we go. Uh, uh, all along. So, um, so I'll raise my hand. You guys just nod me. You see my hand, and then I'll put my hand down. And so there we go. All right. Whenever you're ready, dude, go for it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So my name is Roger Friends, and I will be presenting my untold story on Prescott National Forest. So the Prescott National Forest is not only valued for its uh, diverse ecosystem; it is also protected for its many valuable resources, such as timber, uh, minerals, and land grazing which is all under the, uh, the multiple use management policy of the Forest Service, which is under uh, conservation. And uh, the forest is also valued for its historical significance. There's a lot of people who value the forest for educational purposes and understanding a lot of the uh, historical background as well as the natives. Uh, as you can see with the bottom left picture, this is a uh, an image of some petroglyphs from the second and third Pueblo period from uh, 980. Uh, the forest is uh, also uh, valued for a lot of its wide range of recreational areas. Uh, you can do a lot of various activities such as camping and horseback riding and even kayaking in particular areas. And as for more of its uh, background or uh, establishment, uh, it was first uh, established by President William McKinley in 1898. And this was before the service even was given its uh, national significance, before it was even known as Prescott National Forest. It was referred to as uh, Prescott, the Prescott Forest Reserve, and it was established to help secure a particular watershed for the city of Prescott back in the day. So as for its suitability, there's a lot of unique projects related to uh, Prescott National Forest. Uh, I feel like uh, the one in particular with uh, wildlife corridors with a particular species was very unique. Uh, and this one was related to the American pronghorn antelope. Uh, the American pronghorn antelope were once very prominent in the area of Arizona before a lot of development came in and kind of endangered their populations. They're viewed as a, a key species or an umbrella species in this case where their existence also affects the lives of other species and other plants within the area as well. So the Forest Service partnered up with the Central Arizona Grassland Conservation Strategy, where they have helped uh, preserve uh, some wildlife corridors for these pronghorn in this particular area. So you see the map at the top shows a little bit of the Bradshaw district, which is pretty close to the city of Prescott. And it's helped preserve the population. As for its feasibility, uh, the forest is about approximately 1.25 million, uh, million acres. Uh, its ownership is under the United States Department of Agriculture, which is under the uh, federal agency. It is also uh, divided specifically into three uh, districts under the Yavapai County. Uh, the first one being the Chino Valley, which, can, uh, which covers the majority of the northern part of the forest. You have the Chino Valley, which covers the, like I said, I said she, so the Chino Valley covers the north. Uh, you have the Bradshaw district, which covers the west, and then you have the Verde district, which covers the east. You can see the Bradshaw Mountains, which is the top image, and then you have uh, the northern uh, part of the Verde building at the top. And here is a bit of the maps. You can see uh, that uh, the forest covers up the majority of Yavapai County. To the left, and you can see to the right, uh, the city of Prescott is sort of wedged into the Bradshaw district. The right district. 
Now, as for its management recommendation, I would say that the Forest Service has shown a significant amount of support to Prescott National Forest. And I'd say that a, it's identified as a heritage area because uh, uh, Forest Service has shown an exceptional amount of effort into managing the forest with its multiple, with its multi-use management policy, which is valued for its conservation, recreation, education, and its continued support through many um, public and private entities. We've seen that it protects valuable ecosystems and inhabitants and also regulates resources and uh, various resource consumption. And it also encourages its visitors to do their part in the sense that, like, as an example, like if you're going through the forest and a visitor identifies a particular invasive species, they encourage you to, to call them to pinpoint its exact location and then they would help do the rest of the management. Here's a picture of the forest. All right, nice job, dude. Number next, Eric is going to be uh, is next on. Online. Be a little bit different. Um, my name is Eric, and I will be presenting and suggesting the Harvey Milk National Historical Site on this work site. Um, so, significance I'm going to have to get into a little bit of his biography. He was born in 1930, May 22nd, in Long Island, New York, um, into a middle class Lithuanian Jewish family. Um, his parents were both enlisted, his mother and his father in the US Navy. Um, his parents were both very civically engaged in their community. Um, Milk attended college at New York State College for teachers studying math and history. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy and was stationed in San Diego after college as a dive instructor. And in 1955, uh, Milk faced dishonorable discharge based on his sexual orientation from the U.S. Navy. Um, and after that, he returned to New York. Or, is anybody familiar with Harvey Milk? I meant to ask that. Cool. So, you guys. Um, so we spent the next 17 years working as a public school teacher, stock analyst, and as a production associate for Broadway musicals. Uh, during this time, he became more actively involved in politics and adv advocacy. Um, and he spent time demonstrating against the Vietnam War. Um, in 1972, he moved to the Castro in San Francisco, where he opened up a uh, Castro camera. Um, so during this time, as we're pretty much all should be aware, uh, many LGBT uh, members in uh, armed forces were, were discharged dishonorably uh, because of their sexual orientation. Um, a lot of them kind of gathered in major cities like San Francisco because they were shipped back and into ports like San Francisco. There was just um, kind of conglomeration of gay people in San Francisco because of dishonorable discharges. Um, so with opening his camera shop, local merchants in the Castro Valley um, tried to prevent him from doing so because he was a gay man. Um, so he created the Castro Village Association, which was the first organizing of predominantly LGBT uh, businesses. And this association was an effective power base for gay merchants in the area and a blueprint uh, for other LGBT communities in the United States. Um, on January 9th, 1978, Harvey Milk was inaugurated as San Francisco uh, City County Supervisor, making him the first openly gay man to be elected to public office in the United States. Three years prior, just a side note, Ann Arbor was the first gay woman to be elected uh, to public office in uh, Michigan. Um, Milk achieved this victory by extending his heart and mind to everyone in need, not just the LGBTQ community. 
uh, he believed that issues which affect one of us affects us all. And he spoke out um, on a national platform um, with issues of interest to the LGBT community, women, racial and ethnic minorities, the elderly, workers, and labor unions, which made him a very popular and very effective supervisor because he was a man for everybody, not just um, the gay community or not just white men. Um, some key accomplishments that he had in his time as a supervisor is he supported anti-discrimination bills. He established daycare centers for working mothers, converted military facilities to low-cost housing. Uh, he reformed tax codes to adapt, uh, attract industry to his district, advocated for higher quality of life in his community, um, contributed to the denial of California Proposition 6, which would have mandated um, the firing of all gay teachers. Um, that whole thing is very problematic. You guys should look into it. Um, and it's it's crazy because like with Prop 6 and even being dishonorably discharged, it didn't take much for them to make that decision. So people that weren't even um, gay happened to be discharged on the basis of them assuming that they were gay. Um, but this was monumental at the time and a victory for the LGBTQ community um, because other states were passing similar discriminatory bills. Um, he carried out a campaign with local bars to stop selling beers from certain distributors while driver, uh, the drivers of the companies were on strike. Uh, so he just really worked with the people, with the citizens that were in his community and um, helped them in any way he could. And he uh, made stuff happen that way. Um, so on November 27th, 1978, about 11 months after Harvey Milk was inaugurated as the first openly gay a city supervisor or elected official. Um, he was shot and killed by Dan White. And this guy on the right is going to be the mayor of San Francisco at the time, uh, George Moscone. Um, so Dan White was upset with uh, Mayor Moscone's decision not to rehire him after uh, Dan White quit his position of um, city supervisor. So, in an act of rage, he went to City Hall, broke in. Um, went to the mayor's office, shot him like five times, and then went to Harvey Milk's office, shot him five times. And then um, him and his legal defense team argued the famous Twinkie defense. Um, they argued that he was at a diminished mental state because he had eaten too much junk food that day, and he was distraught over his um, loss of a job. Uh, that proved effective, and he was sentenced only to eight years in, pris uh, in prison, and ended up only serving five, uh, which is like insane to think about because he literally shot and killed the mayor of San Francisco and a city supervisor, um, who were both very prominent figures um, at the time. Uh, this outraged citizens in San Francisco and started the White Night Riots, uh, where citizens stormed City Hall, set rooms of police cars on fire. And unfortunately, the police retaliated by raiding the Castro, um, vandalizing businesses, and beating people on the street. So a couple of things that have happened to honor Harvey Milk. In 2009, uh, President Obama awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom um, for his visionary courage and conviction in fighting discrimination. And then California State Legislature passed a bill commemorating May 22nd as Harvey Milk Day. Um, let's get the USPS. In 2021, uh, the US Navy, which is pretty beautiful to me, uh, named the USNS Harvey Milk. There were, I think, like six or seven ships of the Navy uh, named for civic uh, rights leaders, and he was one of them. And a quote from one of the um, men that are in the service now says, for far too long, sailors like Lieutenant Milk were forced out of our beloved Navy. That injustice is part of our Navy history, but so was the perseverance of all who continue to serve in the face of injustice. Uh, my proposal, so this is the camera shop that he owned and operated. This is his apartment building above top. Um, the human rights camp campaign occupies it now and there's a little photo of Harvey Milk or a painting him looking down on the street. If you guys ever get a chance to go, it's really hard to um, Suitability, so presently there are not enough um, areas in the park system honoring the contributions of LGBTQ plus Americans. Stonewall National Monument would be the closest in relation. Um, 
And this site would represent a cultural resource that is not adequately uh, represented in the National Park System. And with the recent passage of marriage equality in 2015, the future of the National Park System must commemorate uh, Harvey Milk and the contributions he made for his community and beyond. Um, it's of sufficient size and appropriate configuration to ensure long-term protection. Um, the building has been maintained over the years, so it's good to go. And I propose that the National Park Service be responsible for the management of the Harvey Milk National Historic Site. And I propose that they partner with San Francisco Historical Society. Thank you. Cool. All right, cool. Next, Isabel. If you guys don't know about Harvey Milk, watch Milk. <clears throat> Just going back to my CI, go to Google CI Ops. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about my proposal for Powderhorn Ranch National Preserve. Um, so I kind of missed national significance and suitability because there is a lot of overlap, but I'm trying to make it as clear as possible when I address both. Um, so first of all, what is Powderhorn Ranch? Um, Powderhorn Ranch is one of the largest remaining tracts of pristine coastal prairie. Its landscapes include unspooled coastal forests of live oak and untouched wetlands. So this area is significant to Texas and nationally significant because Texas has lost more than half of its wetlands in the last 200 years. And of the original 20 million acres of tall grass prairie in Texas, less than 1% remains. And in the United States, less than 5% of tall grass prairie um, exists today. These wetlands also play an important role in um, uh, regulating climate. Um, so it has to do with flood control, water purification, and it serves as a natural asset. Um, Powderhorn Ranch is home to the federally endangered whooping crane, and it also serves as a um, year round habitat for shorebirds, wading birds, and waterfowl. Uh, according to the Bureau of Economic Geology, Powderhorn includes a unique geological formation called Inc. Ingleside barriers, um, and these support a unique plant life such as sea couscous stem and Texas coastal white oak. The ranch also has a deep history with the uh, Karen Kawa natives who once roamed this land for fishing and hunting. Um, so this would be the only national preserve that uh, in the national parks unit that represents this landscape, wildlife, and historical qualities all together. And um, it also shows, I didn't put this on the slide, but it also shows how private um, private agencies and um, I guess state and federal could work together to conserve a um, natural landscape. Uh, here's a picture of the whooping crane. So um, across from Powderhorn Ranch, and you can see this map, there is a wildlife management area, that green area up there. Um, so it's important to, as the whooping crane, um, population increases to have more areas so that they can actually have habitat that fits their um, increasing population. 
Okay, so feasibility. Um, it was once privately owned. It was bought by the Texas Park and Wildlife Foundation in 2016 to preserve the landscape. And a lot of that money came from the um, deep water oil spill uh, in, Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico. So it was about $37 million to buy. And um, it's about a $50 million project to do all the restoration. Um, all the outland land in the red would be the preserve, so it's all one piece and intact. And there would be sites added for recreation, fishing, hunting, kayaking, and bird watching. Uh, as for management, I don't think that direct um, management from the National Park Service would be necessary. I think that the Texas Park and Wildlife uh, Department could keep doing what they're doing. Um, I think the national parks should set a creation of blanket rules and regulations and should also make a small visitor center um, that doesn't uh, impede on the preserve. Um, and I think the national park service should play a role <clears throat> in making the rules clear for visitors, uh, making sure the story of how the Ranch is told and keeping a baseline for preservation and conservation. Um, so one of the current projects they're working on, like as an example, is um, the live oak on the ranch has gone too thick, so animals can't use it and can't pass through it. So they're using herbicide and prescribed fires. And I think that this is something that can be done by uh, Texas Park and Wildlife. Um, so the national parks did save money. And that was all. Cool. So number next is Scarlett. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Alabama Hills. Please note that I did not write anything about like National Park or anything that is foreshadowing. However, let's start off. Does anyone like cowboy movies, like the old school ones? Thank you. I actually wasn't expecting anyone to say yes. I'm going to keep it real with you. Uh, what about Marvel movies? Anyone like Marvel movies? Yeah, that's, that's what I was expecting to get the yeses on. Maybe I should have guessed so. Aren't you a history major? Yeah. yeah, all right. But anyways, this is the Alabama Hills. It is a very beautiful place. And so let's start off with the significance. Over 400 of those cowboy movies were filmed in the Alabama Hills. This one's called The Hired Gun. That's in the background of those Alabama Hills. And so it really kind of shows this whole American cultural values through film thing because it's still being used for movies. Uh, and it is also used not just for the movies. Like if you want to do some recreational activities there, there is camping, there's stargazing. It's actually qualified as a dark sky site. And there's both hiking and four wheel drive trails. So it's a really cool place to explore. And it is located in a really populated spot of cool things to do. So we've got Manzanar, Death Valley. It's right at the base of Mount Whitney, Sequoia National Park. It is all in that little area. Okay, and so let's talk about the suitability. It is most comparable to Paramount Ranch in the Santa Monica Mountains. However, that is. Uh, because Paramount Ranch is mostly known for the buildings. It is old Western style filming location, but because they built all this stuff. And so also those all burned down in 2018 in the Woolsey fire. So like it, it's comparable, but it's not actually genuinely comparable in that way. And I'm sorry, it's not lame, but like it's <laughs> lame. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's talk about feasibility. It is currently a national recreational area. It's managed by the BLM. I've got this map right here. This is the current boundaries, and I would propose we extend the boundaries a little bit because we've got Man of Steel and Iron Man, and I think superhero movies are pretty comparable to old cowboy movies. They really do have that cultural impact. So I would say expand the boundaries a little bit, but all in all, it's like barely a couple square miles. And so we could add, we could add it to the National Park Service. We could extend those boundaries but it still wouldn't really be qualifiable as a national park because it's still pretty small. And so we could call it a national monument because of the Antiquities Act, 
we could move that from BLM land to a national monument by a presidential proclamation. However, the thing is like, it wouldn't like benefit the area in any way, shape or form because the BLM literally earlier this year released a whole new management plan and they're like, don't worry guys, we got this. We are taking care of the area. And so there's no need for the National Park Service to really step in. It would be best maintained by the BLM, maybe considered an affiliated area, but really no need for anything to change. And so finally, um, the reason I did do this was because I go here every year. I tried to find a photo that was recent, but I could not because I don't take photos. <laughs> so I'm 17 in this. But yeah, it's such a cool place and everyone should visit it. And that's it. Cool. I think Oscar is next. Cool. Yep, perfect. Okay. Hello, my name is Asko Choa, and today I'll be talking about a place in Puerto Rico that would be recommended to be called the Kapawa National Historic Sites. So, uh, this, place, this place is actually called the Kapawa Archaeological Site, and, then, and what makes it significant is that it is the first capital of Puerto Rico in the post Columbian area. Established in 1508 by uh, the founder and first governor of Puerto Rico. Um, okay, um, and I'll explain that later. Um, and the founding in 1508, due, because during that time, Puerto Rico was, uh, was a place that prime example for gold mining, as during this time, the conquistadors were very big on the big three, the big, three, big three Gs, gold, gold, glory, and God. And so in 1510, the king of Spain and that, uh, uh, recommended to become the capital of Puerto Rico due to it having a large amount of gold mines and how successful and how big they're gone. I think sediments didn't even know that it's going to become this big. And what makes it significant is that it's not only the first capital of Puerto Rico, but it's also one of the oldest European sediments in the United States. Some people say it would be St. Augustine, as that was built in 1565. However, this one predates in 1508, so it predates it by over 50 years. And, uh, and it's also home to the friends of, uh, the governor of Puerto Rico. So that also makes it significant. And not to mention, during previous excavations, uh, people found that there, uh, there still are massive, se massive sections of the sediment that's still buried on the ground. So it is possible for more future excavations so we can dig it up, so we can have more reasons. And studying how the people interacted with the natives when they first got here, uh, how, how were the architects that living through that in Spain, and et cetera, et cetera. Here's the, here's the here's the site, and right here, right here is the uh, remaining to the home of the founder of Qatar. Yeah, okay, so yeah, it contains the remains of the, of the house of the founder of the city, Ponce de Leon. And like I said before, it's the beginning of uh, Puerto Rican history that's uh, post Columbus. Or is there in the United States? And when comparing to other sites like San Juan National Historic Sites, that one's more of a military history, as those three such contains these forts that were protecting of the San Juan city. As there's also a ties to between Capella and San Juan, as people, as as between the after the years after it was founded, people were getting there were more attacks on the natives, and those attacks are getting more hostile every day. And people found people there was one, wasn't really a site. Quebec wasn't really a good site to have trading because it was deep, farther deep inland. And they wanted to have a site that was more accessible to trading in sea routes. So they said to abandon the city in San Juan. So there was a connection between those two. How with San Juan, the National Monument is more of a military This is it's, no exciting, it's more of a military history, but this is more of the founding history uh, post Columbia and Puerto Rico. So if it's really within the site, is the site itself is more of the smaller side. It's only three acres long and three acres in size. 
And it's found on the number two highway in south in the town of Guanyapo, uh, I think it's like. Yeah. Yeah, Guanyapo, on the stable number two, the south of San Juan. And within the contains the remains of the house, as well as a parking lot for people to come in, as also as a museum built by uh, plus, uh, people who own the site. And then within, those, within that museum is a small one room that contains many artifacts and remains and other historical documents, as well as mules of what the site would look like or anything that was related to the site. It used to be bigger than it has. It also contained the turrets and other remaining rooms, but due to uh, the light, due to the room and the nineteen thirties were discovered, they needed to expand the road. So in order to do that, they had to remove the site. So they had to move what remains on that site that was right next to the road and put it somewhere else. But because they did that, uh, it cannot be stated as part of the National Historic Site because it was moved, removed, and you can't move you can't move pieces of what was before. Currently, it is owned by the Institute of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rican Motor was an institute, public uh, organization that was created by the uh, government of Puerto Rico to collect, restore, and maintain the foundations of what uh, Puerto Rican culture within the island. And as you can see, in this map, it's like right here. There's the other square, and how far this is here in San Juan. Okay, for management, I was thinking of Mugget like, Manny as a U.S. historical landmark, a like, national historical uh, site. The reason for that is that is currently is also considered a national historical landmark. So why not compare to upgrades from national historic landmark to a national historic site, as has these ties to the foundation of what Puerto Rico is today. So I was thinking instead of having the National Park Service. That's fully integrated into the National Park Service. I think having a joint cooperation between that, between them and the Institute of Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican culture, as they've been holding a site ever since 1950, 1950s, and they have been maintaining it for decades, and they were the one who done the excavations. So I was thinking of adding it to National Park Service, but let the institute maintain the site itself. You might need to increase area for more excavations, but means over might have to up. I need to destroy some public lands, own by some public lands. Oh, and not only that, uh, since it's owned by the Institute of uh, Puerto Rico, which is a part of the government of Puerto Rico, and since Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory, and U.S. territory is, is owned by the U.S. federal government, so I think so that it's federal land. So it must. So in order for it to become as well, so excited, it must go through the president via the Integrities Act. And who is for it? I believe people of Latin, uh, Latino, Hispanic descent, extent, mostly on Puerto Rican descent, they more forward as having more, having uh, the ability to bring more of a historic heritage with Hispanic descent into the national park. So it would be a great bonus for people of that descent. Who will be against it though, would most likely be the locals. As increase in, increase in tourism, my also increase in increase in uh, traffic as it is around it by a neighborhood of houses and small stores. And then want to have more excavations, we might need to buy those properties in order to destroy the buildings and have more excavation sites, which would not be good because like the people own those properties, <laughs> they might not want to buy or sell those lands. So they may not be, they may not be. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, cool. Who's next? Oscar, who's next? I can't see. Hector, Hector. <laughs> so, how do I present? Uh, just yeah, there you go. All right, everybody, good to see y'all again. We're going to talk about the Birds of America National Historic Park and Reserve. Now, we got to talk about significance with this man alone, John James Audubon, father of ornithology in the U.S. and basically the world at this point. 
starting the first conservation efforts for avian fauna, birds, right? He was born in Les Cayes Saint Domingue, also known as Haiti now. And suspiciously, as soon as he was born, sent off to England, where he lived to France and lived off most of his life growing up under the education of a merchant, right? But then, as soon as we get to uh, 1803, we move on to the Napoleonic Wars. And this is prior. And as soon as that year comes around, the Louisiana Purchase comes around. And guess where James Audubon goes? Back to America to escape being conscribed into the military because he did not want to fight for a war under Napoleon, right? So he spent many of his years here in America, living in Massachusetts for a while with his first national home over there, also known as a national site there, but nothing too important as he moves over to Henderson, Kentucky, where he lives out a lot of his life with his family, loses two daughters, runs a business, and proceeds to get bankrupt and then sent to jail for several years. <laughs> After coming back from that 1819 trip of jail, uh, what's it called? He decides he's going to go on a trip to monitor and draw all the birds he's always been drawing for most of his life. But now he wants to capture all of the birds he sees around America. So he goes out with his dog, brings a musket with him, and starts shooting down birds all around just so he can draw them. And from there, he proceeds to go back to England to produce his four-volume set of Birds of America, creating one of the initial most influential pieces of art for AV fauna and ornithology around the US and for the many centuries to come, right? We have... <coughs> conservation groups named after him. Plenty of work to make the Endangered Species Act helped by the Audubon Society. Heck, even the Friends of Audubon, a nonprofit stated in Kentucky, came over there and literally made the state pay with them to buy new wetlands that they raised from the funds around Kentucky. <clears throat> As we mentioned before, more so uh, influential. This is his works of art still the standard for today for many ornithologists of this era. We have his artwork that's constantly presented in museums all around. And you compare it to other ornithologists of the centuries, right? We have the 20th century right here, just as popular as work. But still, that's what just shows how great his work has been preserved throughout history. We have David Sidley, 21st century, still doesn't compare to the absolute detail to his work today. <clears throat> and so we come to the point where this is an amazing influence on our culture for conservation and ornithology. But then we get to this article written by a member of the Audubon Society. What do we do about John James Audubon? Well, surprisingly enough, just like John Muir, <laughs> there was a history of him being racist. And then we come to this question of how do we present these figures that interact with our lives that create such greatness for all of our culture, but then turn out to be pretty awful people, right? Well, <coughs> J. Drew Lanham describes that for most of his life, he was inspired by John James Audubon. And the whole reason he ended up in his career of ornithology is because he was inspired by his works. He would go to museums to see this art but that doesn't give him a pass for what he's done, right? So we come to this point that <clears throat> we get into a controversy of who was his mother because the merchant has a controversial history. Some textbooks say it's a white French woman named Jean Rabin and others, it's a Creole, maybe black woman from Haiti, housekeeper named Catherine Satin, which potentially sets him as also one of the first influential POCs in conservation, which even he ponders the question, do I give him a pass for this now then? And he says, no, but you know what? The work that he does and they did still sprouted many groups who carry the inspiration and the culture for conservation today. So while we don't celebrate him for being the terrible person he was, we will celebrate the work, henceforth naming the park Birds of America, to honor the spirit of conservation, bewilderment, and exploration. 
So getting on to the suitability of this place, we have the original Henderson home where he used to live with his family, settling about before he gets himself bankrupt, having this wonderful place that's also doubling as a museum to present a lot of his art funded by the Friends of Audubon who purchased $1 million worth of his art along with the state to put it in that place. Also got support of the state to make it also a nature center to get the youth excited and happy to enjoy the wetlands they have out. As well as saying that there's an ecosystem that they bought with the wetlands money that they got from the state and they got from donators excited about environmentalism. The unique ecosystem of bald cypress tree, slow and shrub wetland, all in one place. Very amazing. <clears throat> so also I wanted to include the Green River State Forest because as much as I like the small historic site that we got with the state wetlands, there's also more area we need to cover. How are we gonna explore this big expansive creation of nature if we don't have enough land to actually look around? So I wanted to include the Green River State Forest, famous for the copper belly snakes that are endangered there. Also famous for the bottomland hardwoods, important for purifying the water, stopping the rivers from constantly subsuming the area around them and taking over the city of Henderson and flooding them. So we got into feasibility. Reason I chose the location right here is we're looking at a massive expanse of freeways straightly connected to Henderson. All roads lead to Dare, making it popular for tourism, right? We have 700 acres from the wetlands state park and 1,100 from what's currently already housed by the Green State uh, Forest. <laughs> and as you can see here from Kentucky, we don't have very many actual parks that are actually based around forests. They're mostly monuments. The only one I think I would say special enough is Mammoth Cave, right? Special, but that's a cave system. Where are our parks in Kentucky? How are the people are supposed to get interested on the conservation of nature? They're just looking at rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so the cool part about State Park Audubon is we already have golf courses, fishing, cabins out here. You I mean, you got the wetlands to go around. It's got a boardwalk that you can see over here and have a nice time strolling for your nice Instagram photos. Already most of it set up. <clears throat> so we have the state park added here and the Green River State Forest over here, what's currently held. And I plan to expand it to consume what's left of these farmlands over here. Some owned, some not, right? And so with the help of the state in conjunction with the US Fish and Wildlife Services that already take care of the state forest Henceforth, the reserve portion working with the state. This will be there to protect this section of land, which the US Fish and Wildlife have already tried to produce as a national uh, reserve once before. <clears throat> so, henceforth, historic park for the recreation of several people and a reserve for those who want to go out to the nature without all the extra recreation. So houses many migratory birds all year round, obviously run by the US Fish and Wildlife in conjunction, it would be great for the management of our state together. <clears throat> the Land and Waters of Conservation Fund already houses about $2 million, no, $20 million that are still unappropriated, which would help to fund, pay and uh, get the lands that are still unavailable. <clears throat> and as we already mentioned, it's a national uh, registered historic place and reappropriation of state funds from the park already being run by the state could help to recreate and help produce better uh, bottom land hardwoods that we need now in this day and age. Currently the bottom land hardwoods, 40% of them exist from what was total in America. <clears throat> and as we mentioned before, it's got a nature center, museum, hiking, golfing, tennis, fishing. We've got the city of Henderson that would work and have Plenty of tourism coming all year round. The Ohio Valley Birding Festival is hosted right there in that valley. Therefore, they would support it too, as they love to get a bunch of people to participate. And <clears throat> Friends of Audubon Society, as already mentioned, already raised several funds for this state park and would love to join in producing a better one. Cool. Thanks, Eric. Thank Great. James, next.
Okay, so from here on out, if you guys don't have your your um, if you have not loaded your thing up, we'll just we'll cycle back to get to you guys so that we don't lose more time. <clears throat> All right, go for it. So I did my presentation on the Dirt Diggers National Recreation Area. Um, so a little background information, Dirt Diggers Road is a one and a half mile long public dirt road that's just off 395 that's south of the city of Ridgecrest. Um, the road runs through an area known as Spangler Hills, which is owned and operated by the Bureau, Bureau of Land Management. And so my proposal is going to be to designate a large portion of the surrounding area, including the road, as a national recreation area, um, which will be done by the Secretary of Interior utilizing the Historic Sites Act of 1935. So the significance of this mile and a half long little dirt road. Um, the area surrounding uh, is a unique desert climate that changes drastically with the seasons. So during the summer months, you'll have temperatures of up to 110 degrees. And then during the winter months, the area can experience um, three feet of snow at times. The area also has a large population of drought resistant plants that are sparsely dispersed, which means that wildfires don't spread easily through the area. But the main significance of this area is for its camping and off-roading. It's not uncommon to see several camps set up with 30 trailers and campers all parked together at one time, as you see in the bottom picture. And the geology in rolling hills, rocky steep terrain, and wide open flat dirt trails make the area popular among the off-road crowd. So why is this area suitable? It's suitable because there's also a numerous historic and fascinating sites in the area surrounding dirt diggers. Uh, the Rand Silver Mine next to the cities of Randsburg and Johannesburg, which is about a five minute dirt bike ride to the south. Um, the mine was operated from 1894 to 1919 and is responsible for mining and a lot of the silver to build Los Angeles as we know it today. Randsburg and Johannesburg have a really old west field with many museums and have artifacts from the 18 and early 1900s. Um, and then that top picture is of Rainsburg or part of it. Um, also about a two minute dirt bike ride to the north of Dirt Diggers Road is a memorial for two of my friends and everyone affected by the borderline shooting. Um, we, put, we built it and put it up there in 2018 and it's become a key destination for many group rides through the area. Um, and then also 20 minutes to the south, or sorry, to the north, um, is the Trona Pinnacles National Natural Landmark, which is also in the National Park System and is operated by the Bureau of Land Management. So the feasibility, um, my proposal is a 16 mile perimeter border around the, they call it the football field um, OHV parking area, which is where everybody camps. Um, my borders would be marked and easy to define um, utilizing the 395 interstate, railroad tracks, roads, and the foothills. This would also assist in making the area easy to post signage. Um, Dirt Diggers Road is also accessible by many types of vehicles, which makes access easy for everybody and especially for management. Um, the road is also in close proximity to Ridgecrest, which is a major city. So there's many resources if there need be. And then the red line uh, is where my proposed boundary would be. The blue line is the actual road itself. And then the green line at the top is just showing the Ridgecrest city border. So my management plan, like I said, it's to make it a national recreation area through the Historic Sites Act of 1935. I propose a joint management between the BLM and the NPS, and this partnership is not uncommon. Um, both the BLM and NPS have tons of resources out there since there's so much BLM land and national park sites. Um, right now, the area is managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, so they continue to do what they do, and then the NPS can provide education and resources for all the historic sites around. Um, 
and then provide any resources that the Bureau of Land Management doesn't have, um, as well as the National Park can provide the signage and also law enforcement if need be. And I stand in my presentation. Cool. Who's next? Can't see behind you. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. All right. <laughs> okay. Here, who Ready, been, set, go. Who here has been to, to Hawaii? Yeah. Been to Oahu? Yeah. Have you been from Honolulu, Honolulu to Waikiki? Yeah. Well, then you've been by Kalela Ka'ane. National, well, <laughs> what I would hope to be a national sort of battlefield. See if our pronunciation, even Google Translate would not pronounce it. <laughs> uh, and uh, as you can see, it's well preserved here from this famous battle site here. Uh, this is a painting uh, done after of one of the most monumental uh, battles in the Hawaii Unification Wars and literally the history of Hawaii itself. So, why is this place significant? Well, this is the critical battle in the Hawaiian Unification War. So uh, Chief Kamehameha, time is ascension, controlled about half of the big island of Hawaii. He was not king of all the islands of Hawaii, but he launched a 30-year war to uh, conquer the entire archipelago of Hawaii. Uh, and this battle here on Oahu uh, was the largest battle uh, of its kind uh, in the history of Hawaii, the most men, and it was an evolution in warfare technology uh, as the um, natives of Hawaii had bought, salvaged, stole any way they could get uh, European uh, firearms from it. There is even a story of a ship crashing on Oahu, a British ship. Uh, the British soldier was captured by uh, the Natives in Oahu, he escaped, managed to get to the big island of Hawaii, and joined uh, Chief Kamehameha's forces and trained their troops in the use of firearms to help get back at the chief in Oahu. Uh, so, what happened in this battle? So, King Kamehameha landed his troops uh, near Waikiki and Olaue, uh, 10,000 troops. Uh, which, to put that in perspective, at the Battle of Yorktown, the most decisive battle in the American Revolution, we only had about 8,000 cotton soldiers. So even more people in there. And they had to row over on, uh, on small boats. They didn't uh, use large sailboats. So uh, uh, Chief Command uh, sent his troops forward into what would normally be a kill box here. You don't want to go into a valley where there's artillery on the side here. They'll just decimate your troops. But he secretly launched forces up to the top of the ridge here to disable their artillery and pushed uh, the Oahu troops back, back, back due to his superior uh, training, his superior numbers, uh, and his superior tactics until they reached the cliff here and found their escape along the ridge was cut off by the auxiliary troops here. Uh, so uh, rather than you know, submit to defeat, uh, it's estimated that at least uh, 800 Oahu uh, troops jumped to their deaths over the cliff rather than be captured or uh, to die at the hands of uh, Chief Kamehameha. Uh, in the 1890s, when uh, um, a road is being built, from uh, Honolulu to uh, Waikiki, they found hundreds of skulls at the bottom of a valley. And that's how they knew there was a, a large battle here. Uh, so why should this be included in the national park system if it's just you know, a Hawaii battlefield between you know, Hawaiian uh, tribes? Well, the national park system had no battlefield sites dedicated to battles that did not involve the US military. We have sites like Washita, Nez Perez, Little Bighorn, where you have 
Union troops fighting against uh, Native Americans, but history doesn't start, didn't start in 1776. There were plenty of wars and battles that had gone on, on for them. We have no sites in uh, the National Park System dedicated to that. Uh, we have Mesa Verde, which is an archeological site from before uh, the United States was founded. We have uh, geological sites that were done before 1776. So why not a battlefield? You know, it would only make sense. And this is a perfect one uh, to include it here because the battle is relatively recent, uh, which means that we have uh, better accounts of it than a lot of earlier battles that we have to sort of piece together. It would be a great uh, test uh, pilot uh, for uh, the national park system here. Feasibility. Um, right now, the battle site is located within Nuan, Nuanu Kali State Park. And I propose about a one square mile uh, park be set aside as a uh, as the um, this sort of battlefield here. And the uh, Kali Lookout is located between Honolulu and uh, uh, since this is state land, Congress would have to uh, uh, designate it uh, as a the battlefield. Uh, and I wanted to make sure you not you include not just the cliffs where they did, but the valley below, so archaeological teams can help uh, unearth more uh, artifacts. So management uh, currently it's managed by the state of the. Hawaii State Park System, and uh, they do a pretty good job of that. But if we were to make it a sort of battlefield, special care must be taken uh, to uh, uh, take care of the needs and uh, of the uh, natives there. So uh, even from the start, the name, Kalele Ke'ane means like the jumping fish, because all the soldiers jumping off looked like a certain fish that jumped through the, the. So is that offensive to some of the natives there? Maybe. That would be a discussion you'd have to have with them rather than to just uh, from on high, you know, uh, take it out. So uh, I think this would be a perfect one. It's already, uh, it's already got to look out there. Uh, and I think it's great. Awesome, thanks. Diana is next. Oh, she's not here? Okay, there you go. Thank you. Oh, Rebecca. My Angel Logan. Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. I'm right, right, right. Oh, you go. Okay. I'm just going through names. I mean, after Caitlin, we'll take a quick uh, five minute stretch. You guys hit the bathroom or whatever you need. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, my name is Caitlin, and I'm going to present uh, Manoa Kea National Monument, um, and the people say for the heavens. Um, Wanaka is a sacred to the uh, Native Hawaiians and is, uh, is the zenith of their ancestral ties to creation. The upper regions um, are the realms of the creator and the summit is the temple of the supreme being in not only Hawaiian culture, but also in many, Polyn uh, in many histories throughout Polynesia. It is the home of the divine deities and divine ancestors, as well as the meeting place for the earth mother and the sky father. So where the heavens meet the earth. Um, uh, it is also both a burial ground and the embodiment of ancestors that include um, high ranking chiefs and priests. Modern native, uh, native Hawaiians continue to regard Mauna Kea uh, with reverence and many hold cultural and religious practices. Um, many or many of the cultural and religious practices are still performed on the mountain summit. 
In addition to sacred importance, the summit is also home to near 100 archaeological sites and many traditional cultural properties um, eligible to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the Native Hawaiians believe that they are born from the sacred land. Um, and it's why they are like as of 2019 into 20 early 2020, um, many Native Hawaiians were protesting because on top of Monica Kea holds observatories. Um, and just goes into while the summits uh, are is among uh, among cinder cones and red dirt, one notices there are two structures. Um, looming a tall white are the observatories and telescopes, and in contrast are the wood and stone Hawaiian altars. This strange dichotomy serves as a visual representation of the current dispute regarding uh, Manawakea as a sacred site and um, an incredible location for uh, astronomical events. Um, though Manawakea is, is of uh, Definite religious re uh, relevance to the Hawaiian people and story, a history of complex land titles has led the movement of the land use away from Hawaiian traditions toward that of scientific astronomical advancement. The summit is part of Hawaiian's um, ceded land trust. The ceded lands were ceded by the Republic of, uh, Republic of Hawaii to the United States government after the overthrow of the Hawaiian gov uh, government by the Europeans. Um, and Americans in 1893. When Hawaii was annexed into the United States in 1959, the federal government transferred the title of the ceded land back to the states to hold in a public trust. Since the 1960s, the University of Hawaii has leased the summit of Manawakea from the state of Hawaii Board of Land and Natural Resources. Um, the university subleases portions of the summit to the uh, 13 observatory facilities um, for a small fee of $1 per year. Um, though requiring each facility to provide a percentage of its time to the university, uh, University's Institute for Astronomy. The observatories sell viewing time for whatever price they choose and the uh, in the past have rented viewing times at one um, one dollar per second, um, or to stay a night of thirty thousand dollars, which is a lot of money that I do not have money to be able to do. <laughs> um, the university gains largely econom uh, economically and scientifically, while the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the Hawaiian People receive no monetary recompense uh, uh, and lose their sacred land. So the suitability, if the historic uh, relevance was not into question, there are some really cool bugs on the island or on the summit um, that I that. So the top of the summit is a um, alpine desert, and that means it gets very, very, very cool. I'm not a biology major, <laughs> so this is a little bit out of my realm. Um, but arthropods that exist on the Alpine Desert of Marca uh, that is located on the island of Hawaii, the Aulian ecosystem of Mauna Kea Summit is comprised of at least 12 endemic arthropods. I don't understand what that means, but it's okay. Um, Those are all arthropods. Those are all arthropods. I, think. I get that, but I don't know. Um, what is it in uh, only found there. Yeah. Only found oh, okay, 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 cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, it includes day flying, uh, agrites, moths, um, lycosa, wolf spiders, as well as a, a centipede, which I didn't have a picture of, um, that preys on more, more, to, more bund insects, as, as does the like bug. That is one of 26 endemic Hawaiian um, species. Also mentioned is uh, an introduced species of Lymphidea spider, a small sheet web spider, which is what I 
gathered. Uh, and the threats to the Matea arthropods are due to environmental impacts of the summit. So while observatories go up, workers also go up and demolition happens. Um, which is why they are endangered. Uh, feasibility, I would propose that the section seven at the summit be the national monument, which would cover um, all of the archaeological and alt uh, sites and altars of the native people. And my NPS recommendation um, is uh, is that it will be presented as a presidential proclamation through the Antiquities Act, based on precedent, whereas uh, presidents can establish monuments on federal land containing historic landmarks, uh, historic and prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic or uh, scientific interest, um, as well as they contend that presidents have established monuments to support environmental causes such as the endangered to the native species and bugs, um, and would limit development. So maybe there are no more observatories being built upon the structures of these people's native sites. I would want uh, it to be managed by the Mo uh, Mauna Kea and Nian Kao organization, which is a group of native people who've come together and have said, we don't like how this land is being managed, as well as the state of Hawaii and the national parks um, to help mitigate some of the issues that they're seeing. And that's it. Cool. Okay, so we'll take a quick five minute break. If you guys don't need to go hit the bathroom ever, just hang tight. But uh, in the next five minutes, if you guys have not uploaded your presentation, you have it on a flash drive, whatever you guys can come up and, and upload into that, that uh, folder on the desktop for me, please. What's this? Your presentation? Yep. All right. Like I said, I'm going to be short, sweet to the point. So, yeah. Literally, it's going to be a roll. And, but, but don't go too fast. So, again, some okay. people are asking if you guys can make sure we leave the, the title slide on for a second or two so people can yep. make sure they grab the name first. So, yep. cool. All right. Whenever you're ready, go for it. Okay. So, I'm doing, um, I'm doing the Brown Beret Occupation Memorial. I'm going to leave it up there just for a second. Um, who does not know what the Chicano movement was? Anybody in here? All right, cool. So I'm going to skip the history of all this. So just make life easy because everybody knows what the Chicano movement was. Um, so uh, the start of the Brown Berets actually happened in, um, they started in 1968. Uh, it was a group of four Chicanos living in um, Los Angeles. There were high school students. They formed this group that was uh, originally called the, uh, the Young Chicanos for Community Action. So, or it was started in 1967, sorry. Um, they did basically everything that any activist in the Chicano movement did. Uh, they fought against police harassment, um, lack of representation, inadequate public schools, inadequate healthcare, basically just misrepresentation or lack of representation for any Chicanos uh, in the Los Angeles area. So uh, the, uh, one of the creators of the group, David Sanchez, was inspired by the Alcatraz occupation um, by the Native Americans um, three years earlier. So in um, 1972, he organized, after months of preparation, he organized 26 Brown Berets to go to uh, the island of uh, Santa Catalina. They took ferries out to the Bay of Avalon and they climbed up on the bluff up above the casino in Avalon, and they created an encampment that they called Campo Tecalote. Um, while they were there, the mayor of Avalon basically said that racism is not a thing, uh, especially not in the city of Avalon. Um, however, <laughs> he didn't want to get anybody involved at the time. He said that they, the Brown Berets were welcome to stay there as long as they wanted. And, um, and David Sanchez said, it, he, they had no demands, the group had no demands for being there. They just wanted to start a discussion about the Mexican-American social problems. Um, however, uh, the mayor said, uh, this is a model community. Um, there is no anti-Mexican racism here. Um, 
And he said, while stating on one hand that Mexican residents of Catalina are American, not Mexican Americans, uh, he later said after the occupation, living in the same town with these soggy chocolate soldiers for three weeks was not pleasant for anybody. So 1972, saying that, that there is no racism and saying exactly what he said without uh, any, any other go backs on this, it obviously shows that there definitely is racism. So they were there for three weeks um, and they were peacefully removed on, um, in November of 1972. So it was August 30th to November, let's see, what was it? August 30th to November, or September 22nd, sorry. August 30th to September 22nd of 1972. So it was a three week occupation of this space on Catalina Island. Um, and there were 20, no, there were 40 Los Angeles County Sheriff's Departments that arrived at Avalon to enforce an illegal zoning ordinance. Basically the state said, you're camping in a not legally zoned area. So you gotta go. So there were not any, uh, there was no violence. They all said, okay. They got on their boats, which you can see at the end, they got on the ferries and they left. Um, shortly after that, um, David Sanchez disbanded the Brown Berets for protection of its members. However, in the response to rising homicides of Chicanos throughout the southwestern part of the US, Sanchez reactivated the organize, organization in the mid 1990s and it is still going strong now in California and 12 other states. So the suitability here, there are other uh, historic sites um, that look at Latino American uh, heritage culture sites. There are those. There's the Community Settlement House in Riverside. Um, there's the Southside Park in Sacramento and the Cesar Chavez National Monument um, throughout California. However, there is none focusing specifically on the Brown Berets and their peaceful tactics um, throughout their struggle. Um, in fact, the Brown Beret Headquarters building, which is located in Los Angeles, California, which is that building right there, was determined to be eligible by the National Park Service to be listed in the National Register of Historical Places, but it has not officially been listed on the National Register. So with this in mind, placing a statue, which is what I want to do to commemorate the occupation of the Santa Catalina uh, on, on Santa Catalina Island Company property, would be of the same mindset as putting the headquarters building into the Register of National Historic Places. So the specific location is actually right up on the cliff, right up there where that little white spot is. It's a little bit farther down. So that is the Catalina Casino. And to the side is the um, Catalina Chimes, Chimes, I think, Chimes Tower, something like that. Um, so feasibility. The statue would be placed on Campo Tecolote, which is that flat spot right there. Um, facing the Bay of Avalon, um, and it would kind of have a twofold meaning. Um, so it would be there for the uh, heritage uh, or the reminder of um, the Latino people that uh, that they were there, and uh, this is a cool thing that they did. Um, and then it would also tell the people of Avalon, like we're not going away, we're staying here. Like we're all Americans, and we're all of one people. Um, it would have access year round. Um, and it would bring added tourism despite potential opposition because it's on Santa Catalina Island Company property. Um, management, so there would be no direct management by the National Park Service. Um, in fact, it would only be financial assistance. However, fundraising would help with the creation of the statue and with the fundraising, it would be, um, it would allow for negotiations of financial assistance um, because it has to go through Congress to be approved. So if 100% of the cost is covered by donations, the financial contribution of the National Park Service to keep the memorial service could be negotiated within the Congress. And that is it. Yeah. All right, Pirelli, next. Cool. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah, just go up, um, go up, 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 up. <laughs> sure, sure. Oh, yeah, cool. Whenever you're ready. So, 
I will be presenting on um, making Plaza Park from the city of Oxnard into the Chavez Plaza Park National Historic Site. What significance? Um, so a little background. Um, so Plaza Park is located uh, right at the heart of downtown Oxnard. Um, this uh, was built in 1898, um, and the city of Oxnard purchased it back in 1908. Um, they redesigned the landscape. They added this um, pagoda, which is like the known um, aspect of this park. And um, so the pagoda was actually built to hide a pump that um, irrigated the park. Um, so in 1972, it was designated as the 17th Ventura County landmark. And this place, um, you know, I don't know if you guys are local stuff, know that they um, hold many festivals, Dari Festival, um, Salsa Festival, Tamai Festival, and like the farmer's market, market as well. But like, um, aside of all these festivals and all these other events that they hold, um, from a beginning and early in time, uh, they used to hold um, marches that would usually end at Plaza Park. And even in more recent years, um, they still do that. They still end um, at Plaza Park. And a uh, very known leader that held marches here in, in that city was Cesar Chavez. Um, he was a member of the community service organization and he helped local community uh, members um, get registered to vote and created citizen classes. Um, he empowered the community to build leadership and fight for the rights in the workforce and beat the Ventura County Labor Association. Uh, one of his most, uh, well not known, most well known, but one of his known marches um, started in Colonia in the city of Oxnard and ended here at um, Plaza Park where He's, um, it started with about 60 to 70 people. And at the end of the march, he had around 10,000 people all together. Um, that event was really one of the starts of the farm workers movement. Um, so usually at the end, once they get to the end, people usually make uh, speeches and um, um, really uh, come together and like, let the community know how they're feeling about whatever it is they are marching for. Um, um, so Cesar, Cesar Chavez uh, helped help hold protests, marches, and boycotts for better working conditions and wages for farmers. And so, yeah, they would all come to an end here. Um, this park holds significance and is part of the farm workers movement. Um, it really helps and brings, you know, brings a voice to the Hispanic community and it supports one another, bringing strength to a movement that was started years ago, bringing solidarity to a city with like history and agriculture. So suitability. Um, there isn't that many uh, parks designated to like the farmers worker movement. So um, it would be a great addition as well as either like Suzanne mentioned, there is a Chavez uh, National Monument. And, and I feel like this would add to the story and history of the farmers worker movement. And this is actually a picture of a more recent march that happened back in 2017 as well started in Colonia and ended at Plaza Park. Um, uh, feasibility, this would be the uh, boundary for the park and it, the current ownership is the city of Oxnard. So um, they would either have to give it to like, to the federal government and then under presidential, uh, presidential proclamation, uh, turn it into a park. And, and his management. So it would be managed by the National Park System and the National Chavez Center, or um, we could just keep it local. 
and have just like the National Chaga Center and or just have a, like a combined um, management with the NPS. And that is all. Cool. cool. All right, number next, who's next? Uh, Max. <laughs> cool. So I will be doing my presentation on the Santa Ana Mountains, and I am proposing that it become a national park. So for national significance of this site, it is one of the largest and last relatively untouched coastal mountain ranges. And it has a very important ecosystem here in Southern California. There are hundreds of plant and animal species in the areas, some of which can only be found on the Santa Ana Mountains. The Santa Ana Mountains were originally settled by three indigenous peoples, the Tongva, the Akja Chemin, and the Payamco Wisha. Indian village remains are found in the mountain range, most notably at Black Star Canyon, and some equipment from 19th century mining operations can be seen. So this is really a good example of what California national parks can be. It showcases the history of Native Americans, as well as the biodiversity of our state, as well as uh, sprawling landscapes and untouched nature. So for suitability, the way that Southern California looked before Spanish imperialism is a site we don't get to see very often. Extreme population explosion also led to erosion of um, areas around Los Angeles and um, vast urban development. The Tongva, Akjachemen, and the Payom Kowisham people's stories should be preserved and retold as there are only a few thousand tribal members left. A national park in the Santa Ana Mountains could give visitors the experience that the indigenous settlers of the region encountered when they first set foot here thousands of years ago. People would be able to see firsthand how much of the same flora, fauna, and climate characteristics that the indigenous people experienced. For feasibility, at almost 400 square miles or 256,000 acres, the National Park area of the Santa Ana Mountains would be the 27th largest national park out of 65. So it is something that would be quite manageable by the National Park as they manage parks much bigger than this. The park lands are accessible through highways 5 and 15 and state routes 74 and 91, as well as three airports, Los Angeles, Long Beach, and Orange County. An impact to the land will be minimized by using visitor centers, campgrounds, restrooms, and picnic areas, which are already existing. But of course, new areas would have to be made, such as parking lots, increased infrastructure. So there would still be an impact on the land. The Santa Ana Mountains are currently owned by the federal government, encompassing the Cleveland National Forest, the Irvine Company, and Rancho Mission Viejo. So for National Park Service Management, the proposed Santa Ana Mountain National Park should be managed by the United States National Park Service in cooperation with the United States Forest Service, the Cleveland National Forest Ranger Station, and the leaders of the Tongva, Akja Chemin, and Payong Kowisham tribes. This should be preserved as a national park because it meets the criteria of possession of nationally significant natural, cultural, and recreational resources. It should be a suitable and feasible addition to the system and require direct National Park Service management instead of protection by some other governmental agency or by the private sector. This is because it is such a large park that the National Park Service is best equipped to handle it. And if the lands were left how they are now and left to the devices of the Irvine Company and Rancho Mission Viejo, further development is possible and extremely likely. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Max. Cool. Uh, James next.
All right, cool. Whenever you're ready. All righty. Uh, what I'm going to be proposing today is an addition to the National Park System called Chess Records National Historic Landmark. Pictured here is the property I am proposing to be added to the National Register of Historic Places. Um, this is Chess Records office and studio at 2120 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, this building was home to Chess Records, a recording studio owned by the Chess Brothers. Uh, these were Polish immigrants who saw that recording studios in the 1940s uh, to still did not favor um, the works of black musicians. Um, they saw this as an opportunity, um, bought out Aristocrat Records and renamed it af after their surname. Um, their first release in 1950 was Rolling Stone uh, by a then unknown Muddy Waters. Uh, Muddy would go on to become known as the father of modern Chicago blues. Uh, this song would also go on to influence and provide the name for uh, the Rolling Stones band, as well as the popular magazine. Um, Muddy was also influential as he introduced Chuck Berry to Chess Records. Um, in 1955, Chuck Berry recorded his first major hit, Maybelline, here, along with uh, many of his others, including Rollover Beethoven, Rock and Roll Music, and the famous Johnny B. Good. Um, Johnny B. Good, interestingly, was the only rock song that was included in the Voyager 1 spacecraft. Um, to help explain music on Earth. Um, Chuck Berry is known today as the father of rock and roll. Um, his music helped to define rock and roll uh, by fusing the sounds of blues and country, creating something new that appealed to both black and white audiences alike, uh, which is something rare to see in the 1950s. Um, he brought the guitar to the foreground instead of the, instead of the rhythm background instrument it was at the time. Um, he was also famous for his improvisation while on stage and is credited with complete uh, with creating some of the most well known rock and roll stage moves. Um, bands such as the Beatles, Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, uh, Bruce Springsteen, and many others have said that without Chuck Berry laying down the foundations for rock and roll, they never would have become what they did. Uh, another significant person associated with chess records was Willie Dixon. Uh, Dixon served as a songwriter and talent scout and worked closely with Chuck Berry along with other influential musicians such as Bo Diddley and Howlin' Wolf. Um, he would also go on to be inducted into both the Blues Hall of Fame and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As far as suitability goes, I don't think anyone would argue against the idea that music is an important part of American culture. Um, despite this, there are currently only two national park units uh, dedicated to music itself. Uh, these units are Wolf Trap National Park uh, for the Performing Arts in Virginia, as well as the New Orleans Jazz National Park in Louisiana. Uh, my proposed addition would help to expand the story of music in American history uh, by telling the story of some prominent Black musicians, the evolution of blues music in Chicago, and the inception of rock and roll. Uh, as far as fe feasibility, this, uh, this property uh, proposal includes two lots located side by side. Uh, 2120 is the Chess Records office and studio, uh, and 2122 is an open paved courtyard and garden. Uh, the office would serve as a museum, and the courtyard would be used as a space for guest speaker talks, as well as live, as well as open live performances. Uh, I propose that this property should be added to the National Register of Historic Places as a National Historic Landmark. Um, this is subject to approval by the National Park System Advisory Board's National Historic Landmarks Committee. Uh, and under this designation, the property would remain in the ownership of its current owner, the Willie Dixon's Blues Heaven Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, and this route would allow for a federal and private partnership um, the National Park System would provide technical assistance, uh, particularly with the maintenance and curation of museum exhibits, as well as uh, provide strict federal protection that I believe a historic place such as this deserves. Cool. Cool. Allison, next up.
Cool, whenever you're ready. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Allison, and I will be talking about uh, turning or making Henry Woods uh, State Park a designated uh, as designated as an affiliated area with the National Park System. So, so why did I choose uh, this place? Well, one uh, just a quick thing is that I I've only I've been growing up uh, going to this park. Uh, for family vacations, and it's, I guess, the significance to me, but uh, Hendywood State Park is located north of San Francisco in Mendocino County. The park houses two old growth virgin redwood groves. These groves are referred to as virgin old growths, meaning that they have been untouched and undeveloped. Even during the logging era, the old growth redwoods hold true to their name as they show hundreds of years of aging within these parts or this park. Uh, the redwoods are pretty fire resistant, but when they're grouped together in these groves, the redwoods um, are at their most, most resilient and uh, they're able to reach their greatest heights. So this place has a long history um, just in Mendocino County uh, back uh, back to thousands of years uh, to Native Americans living and foraging in these lands. Mendocino County was home to uh, Native Americans speaking the Central and North Como languages. By 1849, the Gold Rush sent an astonishing move of white Americans and European settlers into California, pushing the Native people away, infecting them, their populations with diseases and forcing them into labor if they did stay in this area. The gold rush though had brought a young gentleman by the name of Joshua Hendy, and he purchased the land that the park lays on today. He strived for stewardship and helping his community in any way he could. Thus, he built the first mill in the area to meet the demands for construction material. But he saw the value in these virgin redwood groves and avoided them altogether. He swore to protect the natural beauty, and eventually the park was dedicated on his behalf. Uh, but the groves were later sold um, after he died to uh, many lumbering companies, but they've always remained intact and untouched. Then in the 1930s, preserving the groves was brought to the attention of the Anderson Valley Unity Club, which is a small little town or like a community of just um, south of the park. And um, it's thanks to them that uh, the park was preserved. Um, and by 1958, the state officially purchased the land uh, from a lumbering company, and it was eventually turned into a state park. Um, and lastly, for um, more significance, the um, Anderson Valley, uh, which is a small populated community, really relies on this park as um, uh, income and uh, the valley um, has lots of festivals um, because it's in it's located near a lot of wine country area or like wine and vineyards and so a lot of people stay at the park uh, and uh, summer visitors come and they buy from a lot of the local businesses here and uh, the community is or the park is the closest to the community so uh, people of all ages go to the park and um, it's used for school education. Okay, so suitability of the area is, um, is being represented already in the national parks, um, but the area is different from most old growth redwood coast or coast redwoods. Uh, the groves are located inland and the region experiences warmer climates and less fog than the other coast redwoods. So this aspect makes it unique to other locations as it opens the door for new research uh, area for coast redwoods and how they adapt to the, the changing climate. So it just would be an additive to um, some of the areas that I talked about. And then the feasibility. So the park is 845 acres and uh, the first growth is 80 acres and the second one is 20 acres. The boundary would remain the same considering it would just be a affiliated area. And the park holds two campsites 
uh, with 92 camps uh, altogether. The campsite run, is run by camp hosts and are monitored by state park rangers. The park offers eight trails covering the old growth groves and the surrounding forest. And the park offers access to the Navarro River and picnic areas in their meadow area. And potential uses for study in this area um, and the surrounding land, land yeah, uh, would include, of course, the unique old growth redwood groves and endangered bird species for like their habitats and stuff, which would be the northern spotted owl there, and then also um, marbled merlet, merlet, uh -huh. yep. merlet yeah. <laughs> And then finally, for the management, um, to become a part of the MPS, the park would become an affiliated area and because it's state owned. And so under the state's authorization, I think the best option would be to have a private sector buy um, the park just because um, it has been nominated once to be closed or on the list of parks to be closed within the state. So with the private sector um, and uh, with um, the uh, Save the Redwoods uh, League, I think they would be a best option for, for to buy um, the park. And then they would be like a private uh, or public-private partnership per se. Um, and then the nonprofit um, organization, uh, they focus on protecting a So, and then by um, having it a part of a private sector ownership, the, um, with the power of the Secretary of the Interior, the park um, can be designated as an affiliated area with the National Park System under the authority of the Historic Act of 1935. And then the MBS can provide technical and financial assistance with uh, the private sector of the park. Cool. Hey, is that? Uh, no. Oh, it's mine. I do that every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, cool. So, whenever you're ready. I am proposing a uh, bar ranch open space national trail system as an addition to the NPS or as an affiliated area. It's uh, found locally in the hills of Simi Valley, and I think that uh, local citizens rarely appreciate the space. Uh, significance uh, it's got a long history of settlement by Native Americans, mostly Chumash habitat, uh, habitation dating back up to 5,000 years. Uh, fast forward to the 1800s, the property was once owned by the Sea Valley Oil Company, and the oil produced in the open space was uh, foundational to the region's development. The open space was uh, leased by Howard Marr, which was the next owner, to Tapo Alto Shell and Fertilizer Company, and this was due to the high purity of limestone, uh, which was strip mined within the property for agricultural uses. And that is significant because it was used in uh, agriculture and it furthered the industrial development of our region. Uh, the limestone deposits here um, are rich with Eocene layer ocean fossils, which date back 34 to 56 million years ago. So not only is it a good uh, natural resource, it's cool for scientific uh, research or future scientific research endeavors. Um, it's also an unobstructed biodiverse habitat at the base of San Santa Mountain Range. Um, the Santa Monica National Recreation Area is actually designated this region above Simi as Mountain Lion Home Range P3. And here's a map of the different mountain lion home ranges, Santa Santa Mountain Range uh, P3 home range at the top there. And then the green star is the general area of uh, Mar Ranch open site. Uh, suitability, it's got approximately 40 total miles of well-established trail systems for hiking, biking, and general recreation. 
Uh, it's got a rich cultural history of regional develop development with many examples of turn of the century equipment left in situ. And then some of the things is like a conveyor belt there, there's an old farm combine. Uh, this is actually a 1920s power shovel that was left there finding the limestone. Um, it's a fossil hunter and research hotspot, like I said. Many examples of Eocene sea life, such as snails, clams, mussels, oysters, scallops, etc. Um, the limestone deposits were analyzed by the Department of Agriculture, and they were found to be unusually pure, 98% calcium carbonate, which is essentially what you buy at the uh, health food store. It's a great way for visitors to learn about regional history and experience current biological conditions. Here's some photos of cool fossils found cool. all throughout the Bar Ranch open space. And full disclosure, I was going to bring a huge bag of fossils <laughs> that I collected over the years, and I didn't bring it. So <laughs> that sucks. But uh, here's the power shovel. I just thought it was cool. And I referenced this because I've been riding up to this spot forever and I always thought it was awesome. And after my trip to Santa Cruz Island with the class, I had walked into a little blacksmith shop and it was just so awesome to read the historical plaques and see tools from the 1800s and to know more of the history. So now like looking up the power shovel, I realized how much more awesome it would be if there was a little NPS informational kiosk that tells you about the operation, why it was significant for regional development. Um, feasibility. Uh, the open space boundaries occupy roughly 1,700 acres in the hills just north of Simi. It's situated between Capo Canyon Regional Park and Rocky Peak Park. Uh, the relatively small size would probably disqualify it from full national park status. It's mostly chaparral biome with valley bottom sections of oak woodland. Um, roughly one to 2,000 elevation foot gains and project staffing and development undertaken by the NPS would be easily accomplished due to its adjacent location to Simi Valley and the well-established trail access and road network. There's kind of a cool shot I took the other day. It's location, so you can see sort of a general habitat, I guess. Pretty cool, and like I said, definitely underappreciated. My recommendation for management, it's currently administered by the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, the Rancho Simi Recreation and Park District. Um, I think it should be retained by these agencies due to their long-term management, the intimate knowledge of the site, and there's actually some pretty complicated private land ownership boundaries. Um, ranchers still work portions of the land. Um, I think that the related area designation or national trail system would greatly benefit Mar Ranch open space. And this is due to there's some sort of like, I call it an ecological disaster, but there's open tar pits that are obviously like a result of previous uh, oil drilling operations. I've actually pulled like live owls straight out of the tar there. So it's, it's not good. Um, and with NPS funding and a little bit of joint management, maybe we can get sites like that addressed. Um, historical equipment signage could be posted, uh, like I said before. And then there's Significant Chumash um, sites just miles from it. Borough Flats is a significant cave painting site, and Castle Peak is actually a, a renowned Native American site for trading um, with local tribes. So I don't think there's ever been really scientific development of the site or further research into Chumash habitation. And maybe in the interest of what we've been talking about, sort of take what once was a like 1920s robber baron style land ownership restore it to an ecological preserve and search for potential Chumash habitation. Maybe we could come up with a better name than, you know, the guy that owned it in the 20s, Mar Ranch. Um, and that's it. There's a picture of my dog doing a cool jump. <laughs> cool. All right. Great. Uh, Leah is next. Where's the trailhead for that? Is that what's up? Where's the trailhead for that? Um, it's behind the Steamy Hills Golf Course. So you can go up uh, Las Cajas or you can go to Kilo Canyon. Right? All right, okay, cool. So my name is Leah Greenland and I will be presenting Thornwood Castle and proposing that it would be turned into a national historic landmark. Um, so the history begins with Chester Thorne, who was a founder. Oh, sorry, I should go back. But Thornwood Castle is in Lakewood. Um, Washington, so it's like near Tacoma. 
um, but he was one of the founders of the Port of Tacoma. Um, he had the three-story manor that took three years to build and is 27,000 square feet. Um, he built this banner, manor for his family, and he also had bought a 400-year-old Elizabethan manor in England and had that like disassembled and shipped parts of that manor to build Thornwood Castle. So some... Okay. Well, there was a picture there. <laughs> So um, sometimes when we download it from oh, Google, yeah, there, so yeah. it's all good. Keep going. Um, so some of the materials from the manor in England were the front door, the oak paneling, and the oak staircase. Inside the castle, there are many sites to view with over 100 pieces of stained glass that date back to the 15th and 16th century churches. There is also a collection of rare artwork that is hand-painted onto the glass and mounted in the windows around the estate. On the castle grounds, there is a sunken English style garden that was designed by the Olmsted brothers, which we have heard of in this class. Um, and it looks very similar to how it was when the Thorne family lived there. With three acres of grounds and a lakefront view, many sunsets can be enjoyed from the porches and balconies. Um, there are multiple sculpted fountains on the grounds placed in the sunken garden and in the circular driveway entrance. There are also statues from different collections that are around the property. And some pieces, um, which are shown, is from the Kingsdale Hounds, which is the only set of these statues in the US. Um, over the years of living in the manor, Thorne hosted many garden parties and dinners, and some of our famous presidents, like President Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, would attend these events. Thornwood Castle has also starred as a haunted mansion in the miniseries Road Red, written by Stephen King. The exterior of the castle has also been seen in Oscar-winning film There Will Be Blood by Daniel Day-Lewis, and the last and most recent sighting from this castle was some exterior shots from the show The Haunting of Blind Manor on Netflix. So suitability. The cultural resources that this castle brings for its visitors is very important and many can come enjoy this castle and learn about its history. The artwork and statues are also a sight to see and many are rare pieces that are only found in this castle. There's also a different, a different visitor demographic from the famous exteriors and interior, interiors that are filmed um, from famous shows. And some may come to just enjoy the views and the landscape. Um, they have opened it up to visitors so that they can come and stay in the different rooms or use it for weddings. So feasibility, Thornwood Castle sits on three acres of property with a lakefront view of American Lake. There's 27,000 square feet of living space in the castle with 54 rooms, 22 as bedrooms and 22 baths. There are also rooms and views for the visitor's enjoyment with the lake in the background. With protection from the National Park System, there could be a preservation for, of the rich history and a place for visitors to come and stay. The Thor Thornwood Castle is currently privately owned by Deanna and Wayne Robinson, who bought the castle in 2000. Um, NPS management. So I would recommend that this would be managed by the state of Washington. And it is already on the National Register of Historic Places, but I would like to turn it into a national landmark, which is the um, highest form of designation. And then to turn the, um, to make Thornwood Castle into a historical landmark, they would go through the state and submit a form to the Historic Preservation Office, which would they would review it and then propose it to the National Register Review Board and they would either accept or decline. And also my sister just had her wedding here, <laughs> which is how I know about it. Um, yeah. Cool. All right, who's next? Melissa next.
can go up. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, cool. Hello, right. everyone. My name is Melissa, and today I will be presenting on the what I want to propose as the Cesar E. Chavez Community Service Organization site. Um, the significance. So, American labor rights leader and civil rights activist Cesar Estrada Chavez was born on March 31st, 1927, in Yuma, Arizona. And as a young boy, his family moved from city to city to follow farm work. Um, at age 11, he ended up living in Oxnard, California, in an old shed located in the neighborhood of La Colonia for a year. Here, he, exper he experienced segregated schools and racism. Um, and this is a property where he lived as, as a child, though his story as a child is not what I'm going to be focusing on. Um, in 1957, um, the founder of community service organization, Fred Ross, he's pictured right here with the glasses, encouraged folks to band together to fight against discrimination, better working conditions and wages, and better education, address police, and address police brutality. Fred Ross got tipped by a nurse about a man named Cesar Chavez. Him and Chavez chatted, despite Chavez's skepticism of Ross. He thought he was just another like anthropologist who, <laughs> who wanted to find out like why why they eat why we eat beans so much. <laughs> um, so, so him and Chav Chavez it, um, chatted, and after two hours, Chavez's skepticism skepticism turned into enthusiasm. Chavez could see a future where Mexican Americans can rise together instead of living with low wages, mistreatment, and poor living conditions. Um, Ross offered Caesar twenty thousand dollars in exchange to begin his own community service chapter organization in Oxnard, and Chavez agreed. So during his time at Oxnard, he led, he led citizenship classes, registration drives, and more than ever before, voter goals began to include Spanish surnames. Um, a large hurdle Caesar helped farm workers overcome came about the agriculture industry over the exploitation of the Bracero program. Um, the program admitted Mexican laborers to 24 states and provided, yeah, and provided an abundant cost-effective supply of labor. However, this took many jobs of American-born laborers, and because of the agriculture industry preferred cheap labor, and the agriculture industry preferred cheap labor. So when it became law to recruit settles, only when the labor pool was short, the agriculture industry swindled regulation claiming that domestic workers were disinclined to perform cheap labor, and they did not exist in the place or at a specific time when required. So two groups of longtime Mexican residents were, dis, uh, were distinguished and they were pitted against one another despite sharing cultural um, organs. So Chavez devised a plan to keep records of workers who were, uh, who were fired or refused work and instead were replaced by a bracero. And he alerted the papers and television networks and government officials and Chavez motivated Others to conduct peaceful protests by singing songs, building fires near the farms, and leading marches. So the state and office eventually became flooded with complaints, and these growing numbers of loyal supporters keep kept the pressure up. So finally, um, the head of the farm placement service was fired, and local workers were given first priority and wages increased. So the suitability. Um, this one's going to be shorter. So the effort in Oxnard, this is a quote by Thomas of Margaret Floyd. Um, the effort in Oxnard, however, convinced Chavez that he could mobilize enough Mexican Americans and farm workers to support and build a union. Um, so that was his training ground. And I don't, and the um, Cesar E. Chavez National Monument fails to address it in, in their um, land and the Ventura County Historical Landmark, which this is a representation of it, they also failed to, to address the history of Cesar Chavez and his and his connection to La Colonia. Um, so I believe that it's not adequately represented this um, by other landmarks. Um, the feasibility um, the size of the historic site is 3,217 square feet, um, and it's located in the central portion of Oxnard. Um, this causes some potential issues because it's in a neighborhood with very like narrow streets, and you can't see here, but there's minimal parking here as well. 
Um, but it is located next to an Amtrak, so it creates accessibility. And current ownership of this parcel is a private entity. So I propose that the Cesar E. Chavez Foundation is a main management entity who overlooks major um, choices of this site be because it already matches 90% of Cesar E. Chavez National Monument. And their mission is to like, quote, uplift the lives of Latinos and working families by inspiring and transforming communities through social enterprises that address the central human, cultural, and community needs in this region. So not only will this site be not only will this site provide enjoyment for tourists and locals for public use, it can also be used as a place to develop future communities through self-sustaining educational programs. Um, and the nomenclature will be listed under the National Registry of Historical Sites. I believe it meets the criteria for evaluation because events associated, um, because events associated with man um, who lived in this structure created minimum wage standards, um, which can get us safer working conditions, child labor, and advancements, and um, Latinx and other communities. Um, this building would attain national park status by submitting the National Register nomination through the California State Historic Preservation Office. And you can move forward through the National Park Service and National DC with two criteria and submitting a public comment and getting it approved by the um, private owner. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Sophie. You can't, you can't, uh, do you want to just give it to us without the slides? I can't look at the slides. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, Ernest, you want to go? You want to take us home then? Oh, we skip somebody. Okay, you go, 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 go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. So, I'm going to skip two slides. Whoa, it went to the right. It's getting excited. Yeah. All right. Don't mind yeah. that. Uh, yeah. So, there's a little thing. But hello, my name is Ernest. I'm going to be talking very fast so we can get through this. <laughs> mine is the American Pacific Colonization Heritage Site, or APCAS, or whatever. The, <laughs> um, but, my historic site is going to be, so what is it? It's the collection of islands that are directly associated with American imperial era, which is from the 1800s to the early 20th century, which includes Hawaii, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, Midway Island, Wake Island, and Jameson Atoll. Um, here's a map of it. I tried to do it in the regular um, way that a lot of you've done, but it made it very angry when I tried to include Guam and Hawaii as a whole. So we're gonna skip through that. Significance. <laughs> All islands are the result of the manifest destiny, as well as American waiting for power and resources. These are the dates in which they occurred. Uh, a lot of the resources that they wanted were pineapples, coconuts, sugarcane, um, uh, resources such as whaling in, when it comes to American Samoa, um, coconut oil in American Samoa as well. But also it is a historical site shared by the Tonga, Yapa, and Polynesian descendants as they were a island fairing empire and uh, a lot of them do share a lot of heritage and cultural significance. So here is the areas. Uh, Micronesia is where Guam and the Mariana Islands are, Marshall Islands, which is no longer owned by the Americas, but I have some thoughts on that. Uh, Hawaii, um, <laughs> and then we have down here is American Samoa, somewhere in here, they don't show it, unfortunately. But, um, so suitability, it would be the largest national historic site at over six, Thousand miles square miles or 4.4 billion square um, acres. Uh, the scope would be necessary to show the entire era of the history. I know we have national monuments dedicated to this era. However, I do not feel it associates 
too much with it because it kind of beats around the bush. This is more, hey, it was here and it could become a World Heritage Site because there were other islands that the Americas owned, including the Marshall Islands. Uh, is it feasible? Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's way too much space. Uh, again, it is 4 million acres uh, across oceans and you cannot, and there's no access points. Like, do you have a plane ticket of like 1.2 million to go hop back and forth between islands? No. Uh, well, some of you may, I don't know. But, uh, it's an economic and logistical nightmare to turn this into a historic site because a lot of people who live on Hawaii would take offense to that. Um, and tourism will take an entire chunk out of that too. Um, it would be a hard topic to talk about since it is federal line of the Done through Congress, and Congress doesn't get things done anyway. So, <laughs> uh, natural park management. Uh, simplest solution is I, I like to think of the KISS, which is keep it simple, stupid. Um, allow the local uh, population and government to determine what to do. Who knows more about the islands of Guam, um, uh, Hawaii, and American Samoa more than a Samoan, a Hawaiian, or somebody who was born in Guam? So it would make it a lot easier. The National Park Service would be more an advisor for how they would distribute education and make little placards about it. But um, National Park Service would be mostly hands off in that regard. Uh, I think would be mostly there to say, hey, this is now a historical site and you guys get to decide what you want to do about it. And they'd be cool. And then that's how we would end it. Uh, thank you. And these are thank you in all three languages. <laughs> All right. Uh, that was uh, uh, less than four minutes. <laughs> so, is there anybody? Oh, I'm gonna, okay. yeah, yeah. Back up, founder computer. Is this like, is that? Uh, so okay, so right, yeah, right. You just go up, go yeah. up, go up to the right, to the right, right, right there. Right on. All right, cool. All right, ready, steady, go for it. Okay, so in the fall of 2019, I had the opportunity to enroll in a marine biology lab course, which involved taking field trips to local coastal areas to make naturalistic observations and to take notes on what I saw. Though I have kept my field notebook from this lab, there was one area um, my class visited that I would have remembered just as clear, clearly without them. This area is called the Heron Rookery Natural Preserve and is located in Morro Bay State Park, California. So I'm proposing that Morro Bay State Park and its surrounding areas, including the Morro Estuary Natural Preserve, be designated as a single unit within the national park system as a national park. So the national, so this area holds national significance because of its location along the Pacific Flyway, which is a route used by millions of migratory birds every year. And the Pacific Flyway follows the red pattern that is in that picture. Um, because it is one of the most important water bird stopover and wintering locations for birds following this migration route, the Morro Bay area has been identified as an important bird area or IBA by the National Audubon Society. And their research indicates that this area remains strikingly unaltered from its original conditions, especially when compared with um, other similar areas below uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the seabirds of this area are not only important for maintaining a healthy marine ecosystem, but they also play a role in illustrating the natural history of our nation's west coast. This area offers a superlative opportunity for the public to experience a variety of marine birds and it provides an optimal environment for the study of marine birds. And the bottom picture shows just a few of the different species you can see during your visit. So the units that are most likely to center attention specifically on marine birds are national seashores, which are, as you can gather from the picture, primarily located along the East Coast. There are some units that are exceptions, such as Channel Islands National Park and Point Reyes National Seashore. However, access to areas like these remains severely limited to those living in the Western United States. Um, another reason that makes this unit suitable for inclusion is that marine environments currently lack adequate representation within the national park system. 
front it. So for the most part, the new proposed park would follow boundary lines, which have been outlined in blue, that are similar to those of the present state park. The northern and western boundaries will stay the same as they sufficiently encompass the Heron Rookery. Um, it's like right at the tippy tippy top where the western boundary meets the ocean is like right where the Heron Rookery is located. And the southern boundary will follow that of the Moro Estuary Natural Preserve and the preserve and the area surrounding it is important to include because this is where the salt marsh exists, which serves as the vital food source for the local marine bird populations. So I am proposing that a unit confining Morro Bay State Park and the Morro Estuary Natural Preserve be established as Morro Bay Avifauna National Park by an act of Congress, and that this unit be managed under a mixed partnership that would include the state park system, the city of Morro Bay, Morro Coast Audubon, and the National Park Service. There are also some private owners of this area, but I couldn't get a lot of information on who they were. Um, so this divides the financial burden of park administration and makes the unit a more attractive candidate for inclusion. And in this mixed partnership, the National Park Service should play a more supervisory role. And including this unit in the National Park System would help strengthen this area's current protection efforts by requiring stricter federal guidelines to be followed. In addition to um, the experience and expertise of the National Park System could provide more insight and better approaches to the threats being faced by this important bird area. And just to conclude, um, Morro Bay Avifano National Park should be established in order to promote and conserve the natural values and wildlife of America's West Coast, and to guarantee that future generations could enjoy an experience similar or even grander than the one I had back in the fall of 2019. Cool. Cool. What, before we before we wrap, just one one more quick. So Sophie, do you want to just try it one, one more time or? Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, thanks everybody. So that was great. Um, Russell will I'm sure reach out to you guys, um, but please make sure to to get all your notes in on all your comments on your fellow students. And um, again, uh, double check uh, double double check. Uh, Double check Canvas later tonight to see if it's working. And you guys have a great holiday. And I hope everybody, uh, I wish everybody good luck on your on your finals and on your coming break. Thanks, you guys. No worries.